And uh, the Bible. Oh, tonight I'm preaching a message, Look Before You Leap. And it is, it, it is an important message. Uh, Matthew chapter 26, toward the end of the chapter, we're going to read verses 69 through 75 in a moment. And we're actually going to look at Peter and a big decision he made. Uh, Jesus has been betrayed in the Garden of Eden, uh, Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, praise the Lord. Garden of what? Gethsemane. Gethsemane. And he is brought before uh, the Jewish high priest. And right here in this chapter, we find that Peter follows him afar off. And he gets to that point where he's watching what's going on with the Lord. And he makes a decision. He's been warned, we'll find out in a, in a moment. Uh, he is filled with pride. And he makes a decision to deny the Lord. And uh, we... Uh, went camping. We went camping in Maine with this beautiful 200 and some acre lake. Uh, we had a canoe there and a rowboat. And my little ones, Nehemiah, uh, Samuel, Anna Joy, and Daniel, they all wanted to go catch fish. They wanted to ride on the boat. And uh, I decided that to take them out to this rock. There was a rock sort of off in the middle of the lake that was sticking out of them. You could crawl up, crawl up on. And I took them out there, and uh, they wanted to catch fish. So we climbed up on that rock, and it wasn't a large rock, probably about the size of that table in this, uh, this uh, right here pulpit. And there we are on the rock, and we're putting the fishing line in there, and we caught yellow perch after yellow perch after yellow perch. Nehemiah's pulling up yellow perch. Sam, Sam's uh, yeah, catching yellow perch. Anna Joy's catching yellow perch. Dan is, and it was an exciting, exciting time. A little bit later on in that week, I was looking over at uh, Levi and uh, Dan, and uh, we were talking about Joshua, about going back to Perch Island, Perch Island and jumping in, diving into the water. Maybe not diving head first, but jumping in that water. And so they agreed to go out to Perch Island. And we got out there and he said, Dad, are you going to jump in? I said, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to jump in. And we climbed up on a Perch a uh, rock right there, and he looked down, and the water's crystal clear, and I don't know how deep it is. I do see some rocks, and uh, Daddy, you're going to be okay. You're going to touch the bottom. He said, don't worry about me. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in. And you get right on the edge of Perch Rock. It's probably about this high, and the water's right there. And I, you, know, you get up there, and all of a sudden, you begin to think about this. Is this a good idea? And uh, so I... I Finally got my nerve up. You gonna do it, Dad? Yeah, yeah, just be patient with me. <laughs> be patient with me. And I jumped and I went zoom down, hit the bottom. I was good. I swam back up and I said, I'm not gonna do that again. And uh, the other ones, they began to jump in. And then I looked over at my son, Levi, and I said, Levi, I want you to do something. I want you to jump really far out there. By the way, after I jumped in there, uh, I stirred up the water, and you could no longer see the bottom. And so, Levi, you can do it. Levi, I want you to jump way out in there, way out the, as far as you can, Levi. And sure enough, he got up on the rock, the confidence that his dad was giving him good advice, and he jumped way out there, and right below the surface was a rock. And uh, he hit the rock. And I heard him wailing. I won't call it, call it really crying because, you know, a 15-year-old doesn't like to admit that he cried. Uh, but he uh, jumped in there, and he comes back, and his foot is uh, bruised, and it's big red right there. And he was limping. And, uh, you know, he should have looked before he leaped. <laughs> he shouldn't have listened to his daddy, Sister Esther. And uh, look before you leap. Just say that phrase with me. Look before you leap. Stand with me for the reading of God's word. Look here, verse 69 through 75. I'll read verse 69. We'll read every other verse. Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. But he nighed before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. 
And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech bereath thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered, now Lewis says, And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. And we're going to fill you in with the rest of the story. Look back a little bit later. But, but the Lord said, listen, all of you are going to deny me. All of you will be offended because of me. And Peter got up brashly and said, not me. Though all the world would deny thee and quit following, I won't, uh, I won't deny you. I won't be offended in you. And Jesus looked over and he says, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And, and listen, Peter was lifted up in pride. Peter was lifted up in self uh, self-worth. He thought he was better than he really was. And he got to the point right there where he's on the edge of a cliff and Jesus had told him, don't do it. And he jumps off. And by the way, once you jump off right there, you jump into sin, you begin to deny the Lord like he did. The end result of that is weeping bitterly. Yes, sir. Now the point of this mess is going to be very simple. Often we do things. We lift ourselves up in pride. We know it's not good to jump. We know it's not good to make a sinful decision. We know it's not good. We've heard the word of the Lord, yet we do it anyway. And the end result is us weeping bitterly. And the point being, whether you're young or old, whether you're uh, married or not married, it's important for us, whether we're a man or a woman, to look before we leap. Let's be very careful of some of the decisions we make. They seem so innocent. They seem so small. But often we jump. And the end result is mis misery. It's weeping bitterly. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. We need you. And uh, Lord, it's, it's in some ways a, a sermon where we look at Peter and we see, we know that he denied you, Lord. But the end of the result where he jumped off and made a decision, an awful decision, was misery, it was heartache, it was sorrow. And uh, we do know eventually Peter was used again, but those days after were days of regret. And Lord, I pray that you help us to search our hearts and our minds. Help us to be saturated in your word. Help us to get good godly counsel. Help us to think uh, very clearly about the decisions we make. Help us to look before we leap. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Take your Bibles uh, over Matthew chapter 26. Look with me at verse number 31. I want you to go back over the story just a, a little bit. And we look at this, and it's a warning. And uh, look at verse number 31. It says, And then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. You go a little bit further in verse number 33. If you see it, it says, Peter answered and said unto them, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. And then in verse 34, Jesus said to him, Verily I say unto thee, this, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And you think about it, there's warning and then pride. Warning. And you see the result too in verse 35, pride once again. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. And we think about that. Here, the Lord Jesus Christ himself is warning Peter, warning about things that are going to be, going to be coming in the future. And Peter lifts himself up in pride, does he not? Yes, sir. And we think about that, a warning. I remember climbing up on that roof, getting a Frisbee or a football down, and I didn't want to take the ladder down. And I got to the edge of that roof right there. And, oh, you know, I'm a young kid, maybe 14, 15 years of age, indestructible. And my dad looked up and he says, uh, don't do it. Don't jump off that roof. You'll understand. I said, no, dad, I'm, I'm young. And I began to not heed that warning. And there was an argument sort of back and forth. Dad, I can do this. I'm strong enough. I have the ability to do this. I can jump off this and not be hurt. And by the way, uh, I wanted to prove that I could jump off of this. I am man enough to jump off of this. It's only 10 feet or 12 feet high. I can do it. Have you ever been there? Yeah. And dad's just shaking his head and just going like this. You don't know what you're getting yourself into. And you know, I jumped off of there. And by the way, I landed on my feet. I braced my knees. And by the way, I hurt myself. 
but I didn't let my dad know it. <laughs> I hurt myself, but I get up and, are you all right? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, oh yeah. You understand? Um, I was warned, but I lifted myself up in pride not enough to listen. And it's important. Often we do that. We know we jump into sin. We jump into things. There's warnings, uh, Bible warnings, uh, parental warning, uh, godly counsel warning. Yet we lift up in ourselves in pride and say, hey, it may affect everybody else, but hey, I can leap. I can jump into it and it won't hurt me like it's hurt people in the past. Look before you leap. My dad, when I was a kid, he wanted to make some extra money, so he bought all this uncut uh, uncut, uh, what he called walnut wood. And one of my uncles owned a Western store in Golden, Colorado called Steve's Corner. And so he hired my dad to build boot jacks made out of walnut. And so that didn't go over too well. My dad made a, a bunch of them, but they didn't sell like hotcakes like he thought. And so we had all this extra uncut walnut in our basement there in Iowa for a long time. So my dad, he got one day, took his table saw, and made me and my brother a set of stilts out of walnut. You ever seen stilts handmade out of walnut? Now, those stilts are wonderful because, you know, uh, for a little kid who doesn't weigh very much, when you're 9, 10, 11 years of age and you have those stilts, you get up on those things and you're good to go. You're able to walk around. And my dad had made them very nicely. There was different levels. We put it on the highest level and I could walk on those stilts all over the backyard. I could walk up uh, down the alleyway behind our house. And then Uncle Larry came to town uh, in his 40s, a rather hefty man. And uh, he saw those stilts, and uh, he said, uh, I would like to try those out. And I know there was a conversation that went on and said, you know, these are, you know, homemade walnut uh, uh, stilts right here. You know, you're a little bit heavier than Matthew or John right there. Are you sure about that? And my, Larry, my Uncle Larry said, oh, I got this. And I can picture them behind our 54, 3455 Avenue B right behind that 100-year-old house in Council Bluffs, Iowa, my uncle getting on a chair and getting on those stilts, and if you could have seen it. <laughs> it was about two steps, and all of a sudden the walnut bowed and cracked, and he went feet up in the air, landed, boom! <laughs> and he didn't move for a long period of time. He had a warning. He was lifted up in pride. He could do this. And uh, he did get up after a while, but look before you leap. Brother Bud in the church brought by a unicycle and uh, brought it over to our new building a few weeks ago. I had our memories of riding a unicycle or trying to ride a unicycle as a kid. And uh, I was over there one day and uh, Brother Bud showed us how he could ride a unicycle and I said, I got this, I got this. So I got on the unicycle and uh, I didn't really have it like I thought. And so I decided to take it home and practice. Right before vacation, the day before, my wife warned me, you better be careful. I got it, honey. And I went out there, and sure enough, I got on that unicycle, flipped me up in the air, <laughs> boom, came down. And to this day, two weeks later, my wrist is still hurting me because of the way I landed. Pride, warning, look before you leap. Look a little bit further right here. By the way, pride. Pride is an unreasonable conceit in one's superiority in his talents, his uh, wealth, his accomplishments. He, he, he's uh, lofty in his thoughts. Now, th this is important. This is important. I've lost some of you thinking about watermelon. We've got to be careful with pride. The Bible tells us when pride cometh, then cometh shame. Uh, pride goeth before a destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. And a haughty a spirit, a haughty means a high opinion of oneself. I know more than my dad. I know more than God. I know it's wrong, but I can get away with it. Amen. A man's pride shall bring him low. Look back with me in Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane. And saith unto the disciples, by the way, this is right after that conversation with Peter, sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, my soul 
is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. He tells the disciples, tarry ye here and watch with me. Verse 40, and he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep. And saith unto Peter, by the way, this is Peter, the one that was lifted up with pride. What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. Read that next phrase with me. You know it. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Point number one, if you remember the warning of pride and the warning of our pride. Number two, it's a truth that is still true today. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. We know right. Yeah, we have a tendency to get on the edge of the cliff knowing we're going to jump into sin. We know what's right. We know Bible declares truth and error. It declares what's right and what's wrong. Yet we jump off often into sin knowing that it's going to destroy us, knowing that it's going to hurt people. Yet we leap, we leap, we jump into sin. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Is that not true? Well, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Visions of grandeur. Paul said, O wretched man, not that I was, but O wretched man that I am. And it's so important for us to realize how in, in, in sinful our flesh is. Can I just say that? Right. If Paul can say, O wretched man that I am, we can admit that we are sinful creatures. We have a tendency as people to get on the edge of sin, to get close to sin, to get close to doing things that will destroy our families, destroy our church, destroy us as individuals. And we get out there on the edge and we even to complicate, uh, comp contemplate jumping into sin. Why do we even get on the edge? Why do we get so close? Why do sometimes we jump into something that is so destructive? You know who your worst enemy is? Yourself. Your sinful flesh. Boy, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And look at this next part. If we go back to uh, chapter 26, verse 69, we've already looked at it, but I just want to read those phrases. Verse 70, but he denied them, uh, denied before them all. Verse 72, and again he denied with an oath. Verse 74, they began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And we look at the fall, the jump and the fall. We look at the jump of sin, and we look at the end of it, and it is always pain, it is always work, hurt, it is always pain. I had a 10-speed bicycle. You ever had a 10-speed? They don't make those too often anymore. The skinny tires. You ever seen the skinny tires? Not the mountain bikes, but the skinny tires. I'd gotten this, uh, this black, uh, wonderful 10-speed at a, at a garage sale in, uh, in Lafayette, Colorado, and I used it to go all over the place. And it, it was a good little bicycle, and over there in Lafayette, I'd go this uh, down this way, and there was a subdivision that they were going to build, but they quit building, and they left a mound of dirt probably off the ground, about this high into the air, and uh, they had it where you could go down, you could get your bike on top of there, guide yourself down, and there was a ramp that was just a natural ramp, and you would jump, and the ramp was probably, at that period of time, you'd go straight down, you'd go up off this ramp, and I had the brilliant idea that I was going to take my 10-speed bicycle off of this ramp, and I was going to look wonderful and cool doing it. I remember it. And so sure enough, and I've told this story before, but it's worth saying again, I got up there and I thought to myself, I thought, you know, this is probably not a good idea. And you know, have you ever had that battle in your mind? You know this is not going to be good, but you decide, you make that decision, I'm going to do it anyways. I know this is going to hurt, but it'll be worth it. There's a chance that this might turn out wonderful. And so I made the decision. I decided to Jump, Brother Mike, you've never done such a thing. I know you're a perfectly wonderful child, never did anything wrong. Amen. I did it. I went off. And you know how that halfway down, this was a bad idea. And I hit the ramp right there. And you know how you're supposed to land on the back wheel? Well, it didn't work out that way. And it hit the front wheel. And the front wheel went like a pretzel, twisted in half. And I went flying, landed on the bike, went stumbling like this. Nobody was around, just me and my idiocy. And I, I laid there. My ribs, I don't know what happened. My ribs were hurt. Every part of my body was hurting. And you know what I, I did when I laid there? I, you know what I was thinking to myself? What an idiot I am. This hurts. And 
physical pain. Sister Esther, you've never done anything like that, I know. Your husband has, and so praise the Lord. He's nodding with me right there. He's in agreement with me right now. But you know what? That, that was dumb. That was, that was physical pain. But spiritual pain's a whole lot worse. Your spiritual sin is a whole lot worse. A young, young couple, married. You know, they, they, they go to church. They sort of live with the Lord, but they're half in, half out. The husband is not so much committed to his wife. On the sides, he's doing some things, looking at things, thinking about things he ought not to do. Begins a relationship he ought not. Commits adultery. Becomes known. Wife gets mad. She does the same thing, and they both commit an adulterous affair. Boy, they jump. They know it's wrong. They know it's going to be painful, and they destroy their family. They destroy their lives. They have a kid. They destroy that kid's lives. They should have looked before they leaped. A young man, hears the preaching. He grows up in a wonderful Christian home. He hears the preaching. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. But, you know, he's 18, 19 years of age. He's working with some buddies and friends, and, you know, they, they're fun to be around, and they look like they're having a good time. They begin to tell him how he's missing out. So they say, hey, we're going over here. You want to uh, have some fun with us? Yeah, let's do that. And he goes over there to a place he knows he ought not be, and there he finds them. He's never drinking before, and there they are drinking. He doesn't want to know that he's never done that before. He wants to just fit in, so they offer him a beer. Offers him alcohol offers him that. He's right at the edge of the cliff. He decides, you know, I know what my mom said. I know what my dad said. I know what the preacher said, but it looks like so much fun. He makes a decision. Jumps off that cliff. After that, it's downhill from there. The struggle, the guilt, the addiction, the problems. He should have looked before he leaped. Amen. 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 Oh, boy, a, a couple, boy, they get married and they begin to think back to their parents and how their parents had a nice house and a nice car. And boy, they just get married and they're struggling and they begin to think about things. Or, you know, we're married and we deserve some of these things. We deserve this car. We deserve this. And they don't begin to make financial decisions with counsel or uh, help right there. And they begin to, to go out and look at cars. And they all of a sudden hear a car salesman who offers them financing about a car, a car that's worth about $4,000. We can give it to you today for $12,000. It'll be perfect for you. Honey, what do you think? Yeah, we need it. So they buy a $4,000 car for $12,000 that runs for six months and doesn't work anymore. Boy, it goes downhill from there. We need a nice uh, place to live, and we need a, a new house. And boy, we found a new house, and we didn't think about the neighborhood we're moving to. We didn't think about the cost of it. We just have to have it. We have to have something for ourselves. And so they make a financial decision without counsel, without thought, without prayer, and they look. Uh, they don't look before they leap, and they jump into a financial mess because they didn't look before they leaped. Boy, it destroys families. It destroys lives. The point being, we ought to look before we leave. Here's some practical thoughts. Number one, before we jump off that cliff, pray and ask for wisdom. Amen. Can we just pray and ask for wisdom? Uh, I quote these verses. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, uh, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. You know, when you jump off that cliff, it might hurt you. Well, I don't know about that. It doesn't make sense to me. Trust me, it's going to hurt. Yes, sir, amen. 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 Right? Amen. Uh, probably one of the, uh, most, uh, count, most, the most counsel I give, the most common counsel I give to people, Pastor, what should I do? Well, I know one thing, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And he promises us that, and I don't always have the answer. I'm not the Holy Spirit, but I know that he does, and he promises us if we acknowledge him, he will direct our path. But we ought to pray and ask for wisdom. Number two on that, I want you to think about this. Seek wise counsel. Amen? Amen. Seek wise counsel, and then listen to their words of wisdom. 
Proverbs chapter 20, verse 18 says, Every purpose is established by counsel, and with good advice make war. Amen. Amen. Good advice. What about Proverbs 21, verse 30? There is no wisdom, nor understanding, nor counsel against the Lord. Lord. Uh, chapter 24, verse 6 of Proverbs says, For by wise counsel thou shalt make thy war, and in multitude of counselors there is safety. Have you ever been there where you didn't know what to do? You ever sought counsel? Boy, I was, I, I've told the story probably 20 times in the church, but one of the most difficult years was probably 2012. Uh, somebody got mad at the old pastor, Matt Nettesheim, and wrote a, a nasty gram to me and then shared it with a bunch of other people in the church, and it made me mad. Some of the things they said maybe were true, but not all of them. I was trying my best, and I couldn't believe that they were getting people to leave the church, and it made me mad. I got mad. I couldn't sleep at night. I uh, was getting angry. By the way, that's a sin, is it not? So pastor, uh, pastor came into town, and I began to vent on him. What should I do? Uh, what can I do about this terrible person that uh, is destroying our church? And by the way, I did ask him. I didn't expect what he said. He says, she's not the problem. You're the problem. You need to get right with God and have forgiveness. Amen. By the way, that counsel is what I needed. I didn't like it, but they were right. And after that counsel, I had a choice. Do I follow it? It's biblical counsel, or do I not? Praise God, I went to the Lord and I begged for forgiveness. Amen. Praise God, I was going to the Lord and said, God, she's not the problem, I am the problem. Lord, have mercy on me. Help me to not be bitter. Help me to not be angry. Help me not be upset. Lord, forgive me of my sin. Amen. Praise the Lord. Have you ever been there? Amen. Boy, do you get counsel? Before you make a big decision, do you ask somebody who's godly to help direct you and guide you? Hey, have godly uh, counsel. What about this? Saturate your mind with the Word of God. Amen. 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 All you guys can think about is watermelon. It's coming. It's coming. Saturate your minds with watermelon. <laughs> no. The Word of God. Amen. Well, listen to this verse. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. It says, But as it is in truth, the Word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. The Word of God effectually worketh in you that believe it. When, when you, you know, the Word of God is, it's like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. It's uh, like a fire. It is a wonderful thing. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. A lot of times, a lot of our problems would be solved if we saturate our lives and our minds with the Word of God. I believe that with all of my heart. I think a lot of our, our problems is we don't listen to the Word of God enough. We don't read it enough. We don't saturate our minds. We don't meditate on the Word of God enough. It's so important for us. A friend of mine uh, last year was in the midst of a life-changing decision. He asked me for some advice. And I told him, I said, uh, why don't you pray and ask the Lord for wisdom? I, I quoted that verse in the book of Psalms, or Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. But then I said, why don't you do this? Why don't you take and read the book of wisdom, the book of Proverbs? Why don't you take a few hours and read uh, Proverbs chapter 1 through 31 and ask the Lord to give you wisdom? And later that afternoon, he called me back and he said, Pastor, I did that. Before I was done with the end of the book of Proverbs right there, the Lord showed me exactly what he wanted. But saturate your mind with that. Amen. The Word of God is wisdom. The book of Proverbs is this last one right here. Have godly friends that help you walk with the Lord. Amen. Have godly friends that help you. Don't jump. By the way, some of those uh, friends of you will say, hey, come on, jump with me. And they jump out into sin. And by the way, we have bad friends. We follow them jumping off cliffs. Right, right. And boy, it's important to, to saturate your lives with good friends. Have godly friends that help you walk with the Lord. Have godly friends that help you walk with the Lord. Have godly friends that help you walk with the Lord. By the way, young folks that are not married yet, make sure you have good godly friends. Amen. Have friends that will help you to walk with the Lord. People that challenge you with the Word of God. People who are faithful in the things of God. People who help you not hurt you. People that uh, love God with all of their hearts. Amen. Amen. Boy, it helps you so very much. Godly friends that lead you close to the Lord. I remember, I've tried in my life to choose friends that influenced me to walk closer with the Lord. I made a mistake, and it reminded me, after, shortly after I got saved, um, I, and I've told the story about how I moved to San Diego. And I thought it was no big deal to strike up a friendship with somebody who was unsaved. And I started going golfing with them. You know, it's just a little bit of golf. It's just a little sports, a little bit of activity. I know they're not in church, and I know they don't care about the things of God, but I like to golf. I like to have fun. It's no big deal until they break out the beer. 
It's just a cuss word. It's just a beer. But you know, sin, sin, you don't even think about it. The friends begin to influence. Why don't you smoke? Why don't you drink? Why don't you cuss? And I, I tell you what, I realize my sinful flesh is exceedingly sinful. And boy, quicker, it's just a quick, slippery slope into sin. And that period of my life in San Diego is about five months of darkness. And where did it start, friends? I chose the wrong friends. By the way, you may not believe me, but it's true. There's a hundred stories probably here tonight that know what I'm talking about. It's sad. It's sad. Our spirit indeed is willing, but our flesh is exceedingly weak. Have godly friends that help you walk with the Lord. Have friends that go to church. Friends that read the word. Friends that pray. Friends that care about the things of God. Friends that encourage you not to jump off the cliff. It's done. Jump. Uh, the fall and pain right there. It's painful, isn't it? Oh, the old story. Oh, remember that sermon I preached years ago? You remember when we got here? Do you remember the parking lot when it was smaller? Anybody remember that? Mansfield, remember that? Amen. And I had that great idea of expanding the parking lot. We rented a bulldozer, Brother Payton. It was a brilliant idea. Uh, we rented a backhoe. That was brilliant. And we began to dig out the portion of the, uh, the, uh, the wonderful parking lot right there. And the old pastor, we created Mount Grace that was originally out there, and I'd been working on the backhoe for that week, and uh, all of a sudden that bulldozer looked really good to me. And uh, I said, I'm going to try out that bulldozer. And I got me up on the bulldozer right there. I didn't read the instructions. I didn't uh, even put my seatbelt on. And I drove the bulldozer up on top of Mount Grace. Chick, 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 and there my wife drives up in the van. She parks right there looking at the old uh, pastor, Matt Nettesheim. And I said, I am construction worker. I'm amazing. I'm wonderful. Look at me. And this is a bad moment in my life. I got it to the edge of the mount right there. And I decided I was going to show my wife how I could drive over the edge. And it was going to be wonderful. And I began to go out. I didn't realize how a bulldozer works. So I went chick, chick. And it launched me out of the bulldozer. I went flying through the air. And uh, I landed there. And my wife, she saw it. And the thing with the bulldozer, it kept going. It didn't stop. And it looked like I was getting ran over. I pray the Lord miraculously intervened. I don't know how I didn't die that day. But it kept going. And it's going towards the neighbor's yard. And then what do you do? You, I get up. I wasn't hurt. Praise God. I, I didn't die, Mrs. Nettesheim. And, okay, it's looking for some sort of a confirmation right there. And I started running after the bulldozer. going right towards the neighbor's house. And you know how the track of the bulldozer, I decided I'm going to jump on that track <laughs> to stop the bulldozer. And the last second, I decided that would be a bad idea. In the last second, I dove right over there, and I jumped on the back of that thing. It's still going almost at the neighbor's house. In the last possible second, I was able to turn it off. Thank you, Jesus. What an idiot I was. <laughs> Brother Hatfield, what an idiot. I didn't read the instructions. I didn't wear the safety belt right there. I was showing off right there. I was making dumb decisions, and in truth, it could have killed me. I know by the grace of God, I'm alive today. Yes, We're seriously not maimed. Amen. And I'm, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. It's, yes, it's, it's sort of funny, but it's really not. It's not, not something to play with. Same with sin. Right. Boy, this week, the old Satan gets you on that edge of the cliff and tells you young folks to jump off, jump into sin, alcohol, pornography, adultery, a friendship. Boy, don't, don't jump. Yes, Get some godly right. friends that hold you back and say, don't do it. Well, get some godly counsel. Get some wisdom from the Almighty God. Look before you leap. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we do love you.